things are not always as they look at first. We've got a case today where all the evidence piled up against a man who swears he didn't pull the trigger. Yeah, do you think someone could sleep through a gunshot from a hunting rifle? Let's find out together. The Rocky Mountains hold many mysteries. Millions of people enjoy the natural beauty, but some come across the hidden dangers. This is Rocky Mountain Red Handed. I'm Melanie here with my friend Becky. I didn't have a great word today. That's so okay. Harry. It's okay. Don't worry about it. It's one of I'll those take days. friend. Okay. I'll take friend. The stories we share are remembered by some, but forgotten by many. Let's dive in to Rocky Mountain Red Handed. Hello, friends. I hope you are all well out there. Thanks for being with us today. Yeah, we hope everyone is healthy and happy, and thank you for joining us. So Rocky Mountain Red Handed is, take a guess, it's growing each week. I know we say that every week, but it really is. So please keep sharing with friends and family. Rate and review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps us out. Yep. And just a reminder to be sure you are subscribed and following us on social media. So you can find us on Instagram at Rocky Mountain Red Handed. Um, we did this week put a link to our link tree, which will link you to all of our social media. So you can find that in the show notes. There's so many of them now. Yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. find us on all the things uh, that you can check out there if you don't know where to find <laughs> us. So stay connected. Before we get started, we'd like to offer you a heads up. Today's story contains details that might be difficult for some to hear. Though we always put great care and respect into each of our cases, the true stories do often explore physical violence, sexual violence, familiar violence, suicide ideation, other content that may be upsetting or triggering to some. So please take a moment to decide what's best for you. If you or someone you know needs help with emotional and or crisis counseling and resources, please dial 988 in the United States ask for help. You are never alone. So without further delay, let's get to our episode, Becky. So this case is from the great cowboy state. The episode is entitled Corpus Delecti, which is Latin, which translates to body of the crime. Martin Frias and Ernestine Heen Perea were a couple who met in Wheatland, Wyoming, a small town of about 3,500 people. Martin was attracted to Ernestine because of her warmth and her energy. She loved to dance and socialize and was known for her big smile. In 1979, Martin came to the United States illegally from Mexico for the most common reasons. He was looking for opportunity, better work, a better life and education for his family he hoped to have one day. He got hired at a marble processing plant and had a great reputation for his intelligence and he was a very hardworking man. Two years after Martin settled into Wheatland, he met Ernestine. They were both 24 years old. Ernestine had a young daughter and the two decided that they wanted to start a life together. They rented a mobile home on the outskirts of Wheatland and had two children together. They were a very passionate couple with big ups and big downs. You know, couples like that, right? Mm -hmm. High or low, high or low, yeah. They loved each other, but for some reason they seemed to squabble over just stupid little stuff. That's always where those squabbles are, just stuff that doesn't really matter. Over time, the downs were taking over the ups and the couple was drinking more and more. They grew apart from each other to the point where they chose to sleep in different rooms. Ernestine took the largest bedroom while Martin slept on the couch each night. They had not shared each other's bed for months and the relationship was practically non-existent. They were just cohabitating. Yet they had their children to care for and they lived under the same roof. Yeah, exactly. They're just cohabitating, kind of just co-living right. pretty much yeah martin stated that he was growing more and more concerned about ernestine she had emotional problems and had attempted to take her own life in the past the couple had been fighting over her lack of care she was putting into her parenting the children were not being taken care of properly yeah, so there really were a lot of concerns with how she was parenting mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah. Martin alleged that she was, like, drinking too much. She was acting erratic. Everything, like, came to a boiling point on July 5th, 1984. Ernestine spent the day at a local park with her children and several friends, most of them who were male. She spent the day drinking and socializing, and she didn't get home until around 10.30 p.m. So Martin gathered the children and prepared them for bed, and Ernestine just went straight to bed. The little home quieted down quite quickly as everyone went right to sleep. That is, until about 1 a.m., Martin woke up to one of the children crying. So he got up to check on his daughter when he heard her crying and telling her mother to get up. 
Martin said that he turned on the light and he saw Ernestine. She was laying on her back with a large rifle next to her. Her stomach was bloody along with the walls around her. Martin said he called 911 immediately. He only spoke some English, so in you know, broken sentences, half in English, half in Spanish, Martin tried to communicate with the 911 operator. He struggled with explaining their location of like where they were at, where the trailer was at, what was going on in the home. So he just instructed the operator to have the emergency responders meet him at a local cafe, which was really smart of him. Yeah, that, it, that would be hard though to be able to not communicate in that situation. Mm -hmm. Martin ran to the cafe, met the workers, and brought them back to the trailer they called home. Unfortunately, when the police arrived, they were already quite familiar with this home. Law enforcement had responded to domestic disturbances there several times in the past. It was known that the couple had been violent, and Ernestine had been seen with bruises and cut lips before. So at first, Martin made a huge mistake. He made the mistake of telling the police that he wasn't at home that evening. Uh, the trailer showed no signs of a break-in, so the police pressed him on that. He came clean and said that he had been home all evening and night. Martin claimed that he was asleep, and get this, he said he did not hear the rifle go off at all. He said the gunshot did not wake him up. I mean, to immediately be telling a lie when the police ask you a question, like, and then have to change your story because it doesn't line up. That's, well, I mean, sketchy. yeah, detectives don't like stories changing. Right. Like that. And I have a hard time believing you're not going to hear a hunting rifle going off in a trailer. Yeah. Like those trailer walls are paper thin. Yeah. You have to be really close to each other. There's not a lot of space and the walls are really thin. Exactly. Exactly. It would wake me up for sure. Yeah. I'm a light sleeper. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the weapon. Okay. Ernestine was found lying next to a 300 Weatherby Magnum hunting rifle. Ballisticstudies.com states, quote, the strengths of the 300 Weatherby lie in its ability to produce effective killing on a wide variety of game species and body weights out to ranges well beyond 1,100 yards. So, like, this is a very large, very powerful weapon, right? Yeah, 1,000 yards, that's a huge weapon. Yeah, mm -hmm. we can only imagine, like, what it would do to a human body at such a close distance. Yeah, not a pretty sight. And remember, they are in a trailer. So, like you said, they are, like, on top of each other. Yeah, and again, like, he claimed to not hear the gunshot. So this just seems weird to the police from the very beginning. Right? Yeah. It seems really hard to believe. Martin said he did not wake up when the gun went off, yet he did say he woke up just a little bit before because he thought he heard a twig break outside or he thought that maybe it could have been Ernestine like kicking off her shoes in the other room. You can't hear a gunshot, but you hear a twig or a shoe. He said he awoke to the noise and fell right back asleep. Martin told the police that he believed that Ernestine had died by suicide. This seems sketchy, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsors. Rocky Mountain Red Handed is brought to you by Balance of Nature. I love my balance of nature. I take it every morning and it makes me feel so good. I do not like to eat vegetables, so I take my balance of nature to be able to get in the nutrients that I need. Go to balanceofnature.com and use promo code REDHANDED for 35% off your first order. We call it three and three. I take my three capsules of veggies, three capsules of fruits, and it gives me all I need. So that's balance of nature, promo code REDHANDED. Thank you to our sponsors. So, Mel, Martin told the police that he had slept through a gunshot in a trailer. Yeah, I mean, that's really hard to believe. He's saying, like, he slept through a hunting rifle being shot in the next room, yet he woke up when a twig snapped. Yeah, that's, that seems suspicious. Yeah, really suspicious. Yeah, so let's get to the forensics. The forensic investigation showed Martin's fingerprints all over the rifle. Ernestine's were only found on the scope of the gun. Okay. It is officially not looking good for Martin. Definitely. So Ernestine had a large wound on her abdomen, on the front of her body, and a small wound on her back. Remember, exit wounds are usually larger than entrance wounds. Especially, I would think, with a hunting rifle. Yeah, definitely. Right? Yeah, so it's definitely looking like Ernestine was shot in the back. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what the coroner on the scene believed. Yes. 
Ernestine's pants were also ripped near the zipper and her button had popped off of her jeans. I mean, that kind of shows a possibility of like a physical struggle, don't you think? Yeah, it definitely could be. I mean, it seems like some type of a, a attempted sexual assault of some, so- of some sort. Yeah. On the inside of the front of her shirt, there was a lot of blood, tissue, and bone fragments. It's common to see this due to like the bullet leaving it behind as it passes through the body. Yeah, which makes sense. So, okay, it's, it was on the front of the shirt, which again would be evidence that she was shot in the back. Yeah, it yes. looks like that, mm-hmm. definitely. So there is no gunshot residue, or GSR for short, found on the front of her clothing or skin, which again, if she had shot herself, she would have GSR on the front of her clothing and her hands. Right, but there was no GSR found on her back either, right? So this told investigators that the rifle was not up against her clothing. The gun would have had to have been fired from at least 30 inches away, even up to like three feet away from Ernestine. They also discovered a lot of bruising on her abdomen. Yeah, the autopsy seemed to support what the police already believed, that this was not a suicide. The bullet entered through the back wound, about a half inch size, hit her vertebrae, traveled through her body, and came out the abdomen, leaving that large gaping wound. Two bullet fragments were found lodged in the wall along with some blood splatter on the lower portion of the wall. Yeah, I mean, this is all telling us that Ernestine was shot in the back, right? Yeah, like everything, yeah. So, of course, Martin Frias just denied any part of her death. In fact, Martin had a broken arm at the time of Ernestine's shooting, and he said he couldn't have fired the rifle, even if he wanted to, if he couldn't have done it. Which is a good point. I get that if he's had a... That, that's a big gun. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I think it... I think that if he would have tried to shoot her with the rifle, couldn't she have, like, easily fought him off with a broken arm and that heavy, long gun? I mean, the man only has one working arm, and that's a big gun, and she's a healthy woman. I mean, it seems like she could be able to fight him off. Wouldn't you think? I don't know. I would think so. Well, ultimately, Ernestine's death was ruled as a homicide. Launch. No surprise. Sorry. No surprise. If you're shot from behind with Mm -hmm. a big gun like that, I mean... Law enforcement believe that she came home from her day of drinking and flirting with other men. The couple fought. Ernestine's pants were ripped, which could have been like an attempt of sexual assault, along with the bruising on her stomach. Prosecutors believe she fell to the floor, and while she was trying to get up, Martin shot her in the back. Yeah, and the splatter on the lower lower walls would support that theory, right? Right. Law enforcement and prosecution believe that the impact of the bullet made her body twist and she landed on her back. Then they believe Martin set the weapon down next to her to stage a suicide. They believe that he could have easily fired the weapon with the broken arm. Which they probably know better than we do. I mean, maybe he could have. Which, you know what, though? The the twist in the air is not jiving with me. Seems weird. Do, doesn't it? If you're shot from behind. I don't know. I don't know. That That's a, a full twist in the air? I don't know. It's strange. I don't know. It's, a, it's just a crazy case. Just three days after Ernestine's death, Martin Frias was arrested and charged with his common law wife's murder. He couldn't afford an attorney, so the state of Wyoming appointed two attorneys to his case, state public defender Leonard Munker and Platte County public defender Robert Moxley. So remember Mr. Moxley, he's very important in the story. Martin Frias's bond was set at $500,000, but it was reduced to $250,000 at the request of public defender Moxley. The prosecution team assigned to this case was Platte County Attorney Doug Bryant and Assistant Attorney Doug Weaver. The trial was to be held at Platte County Courthouse under 8th Judicial District Judge William A. Taylor. And the defense had a difficult time creating a defense, which yeah. is not a surprise. Not a surprise at all. It he definitely seems guilty. Yes, for sure. It was mandatory for the public defenders to use the state crime lab to process the evidence at the time. Well, the state crime lab had already ruled Ernestine's death as a homicide, and it was the same lab that the prosecution was using to support their case. So, needless to say, it was a rough road for the beginning of the defense, for sure. The prosecution had forensic evidence to back up their case. In addition, Richard Murphy, who was a crime lab specialist, testified that five beer cans found at the scene of the crime, showed signs of Martin Frias' saliva. So he was drinking that night. Right, which 
never looks good. Mm -hmm. Lots of people drink, so it's Mm -hmm. a common thing, but when something like this happens, it doesn't look good. Exactly, yeah. Also, a social worker with Southeast Mental Health Center in Cheyenne testified that the the four-year-old daughter, Rihanna, confessed multiple times to killing her mother. Then she told the social worker that her father, Martin Frias, had killed her mother. I always hate it when children have a part of anything like this, like that poor little girl. I know this this whole situation is just so traumatic and then to have to relive it by telling somebody and I feel like kids tend to change their story based on what the adults are saying right like you have to be really careful when you're interviewing a child like that because mm-hmm. the things you say as an adult are going to change their story mm-hmm. don't you think yeah and I, I can't I can't align any sources with this but I remember reading the past that it's actually quite common for children to take it on themselves like I did that because their little brains are just trying to protect the people around them so so sad so all all three children were there in the trailer that night as well that's horrible well the defense came out swinging during a preliminary hearing Moxie proposed the hypothesis that maybe Ernestine had asked her four-year-old daughter to pull the trigger which that's just so terrible I don't like that Defense attorneys, man. We need them, but <laughs> holy we do need cow. Them. Defense attorneys have a dirty job. They do. They do. So I, okay. Robert Christensen, a Wyoming DCI firearms and explosives specialist, testified that he performed a nitric acid test on Ernestine's hands. The results show that it was a possibility that she fired the weapon for herself. Martin Frias testified during his trial on the stand. He said, quote, I was positive she shot herself. I think it was a suicide. I know that as a fact, I didn't shoot her. So he did get up and testify during his own trial. He did. He did testify during his own trial. Moxley stated during the trial that Martin Frias is a Mexican national. He could have easily fled to Mexico, but he chose to stay and not hide. Martin testified, quote, Quote, I don't have no reason to run. I didn't commit the crime. I don't feel the blame. I don't have no reason to run. Martin showed very little emotion during the trial. The only time he cried quietly was during the closing statement of the prosecution. The jury, all white, seven men, six men, deliberated for four and a half hours. That's seven men, six men. I'm on it today. You're good. I messed you up. No, no, no. The jury, all white, seven men, six women, deliberated for four and a half hours. Martin Frias was convicted of second-degree murder at 1.15 a.m. on December 9, 1984. He was sentenced to 25 to 35 years in prison. And that's the end of the episode. No, no, we're far from over. (laughs) Instead of throwing in the towel and moving on the next case, Robert Moxley went straight to work on an appeal. He had a laundry list of concerns for the state. Moxley was very critical of the Platte County coroner, Harley Prell. He said he misled the state pathologist and criminal investigators. Moxley stated, quote, The coroner at the scene, who was Prell, said, This isn't a suicide. By the time the body was taken to the pathologist, the pathologist had been told it was a homicide. The pathologist decided that she had been shot before he took her shirt off. He also had concerns regarding the state pathologist. He claimed that the pathologist was not qualified to perform autopsy for forensic cases, which is kind of a big deal. Yeah. Also, Moxley brought in Dr. Robert Lance, an independent GSR expert, to test Ernestine's blouse. Lance used a technique called scanning electron microscopy with X-ray emission. Fancy name, right? That's Mm -hmm. a big name. This testing technique provides an extreme sensitivity to GSR. Believe it or not, Dr. Lance's test proved just the opposite, actually. It proved that the gunshot entered the front of Ernestine's body and exited the back. This obviously completely contradicted what the state crime lab had reported in which they found zero GSR anywhere on the blouse. Yeah, so Moxley studied up on forensic and discovered the tests used by the Wyoming State Crime Lab at the time were completely obsolete. The tests were super outdated and they left a huge window for human error. Moxley told the Casper Star Tribune on June 2, 1985, quote, I have to show the court that new evidence is significant. 
In my mind, the new evidence absolutely disproves the essential element of homicide, which is corpus delecti. Becky, can you tell us what corpus delecti means? Oh, well, of course, I'm fluent in Latin. (laughs) Corpus delecti is a Latin term used in law, meaning body of the crime. Basically, it means that no one should be accused of a crime without sufficient evidence that a crime actually occurred. So essentially, Moxley is trying to prove that there was no murder. If it's a suicide, there was no crime committed. So with the new test showing GSR on the front of Ernestine's blouse, you would think things would change, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Nope, not what happened. Martin Fries remained behind bars for two years, but finally Moxley discovered another way to give Martin another chance. Yeah, I get this. Moxley kind of threw himself under the bus a little bit. Ineffective counsel. Wow. Believe it or not, it wasn't this new evidence that granted Frias a new trial, but the claim that his attorney, Moxley, were, was an ineffective during the initial trial. As reported in the Casper Star Tribune, quote, his conviction must be reversed because he may not have understood that he didn't have to testify against himself. Wow. Interesting, right? Yeah. Finally, the Wyoming Supreme Court granted Frias a new trial on June 26, 1986. So the defense, led by Moxley, which is interesting that he got a new trial for ineffective counsel and yet has the same counsel. Mm -hmm. So he got to work to build a strong case, and so did the prosecution. The state ordered Ernestine's body to be exhumed for a second autopsy. They called in the big guns this time. Dr. Charles Petty, he was chief medical examiner for Houston, Texas, to perform this autopsy. The results were the same as this first autopsy. The bullet entered through the back and came out the stomach. So at the time, the foremost expert in the country of high-velocity gunshot wounds was Dr. Vincent DeMeo. This is amazing. This is like a hero. Like a, this is amazing. This is like a miracle. Remarkably, Moxley saw that Dr. DeMeo was going to be lecturing in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Yeah, so Moxley hopped in his car and he drove to Cheyenne, which is about 70 miles away, and went and cornered Dr. DeMeo at his hotel. If I get in trouble, I want Moxley defending me. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So he finds Dr. DeMeo, quickly gave him a rundown on Martin's case, and showed him the autopsy photos right there in the lobby of the hotel. He is dedicated. Dedicated. Dr. DeMeo examined the photos closely for a few seconds and clearly stated that her abdomen showed a contact wound, not an exit wound. Mind blown right there, right? That's like a mic drop. Yeah. Dr. DeMeo later testified of this during the second trial and said the absence of blood or tissue on the gun means absolutely nothing. Statistically, maybe like half the time with handguns, you don't find blood evidence on the muzzle. It's a little more common in shotguns. Remember, there was, like, clothing between the gun and the skin. Yeah, so Dr. DeMeo also testified that when a trigger is pulled with a live round, a small flame is generated in the muzzle. It's it's really hot. It's between 14 and 1500 degrees, along with gas, soot, and carbon from the burning gunpowder. So because the defense believed that Ernestine had the muzzle against her body, they tested for these substances. Yeah. And they did find their evidence. They found soot and small burns from the flame. That is proof that the gun was in contact with her body. Dr. DeMeo believed that the gas discharge from the weapon actually temporarily inflated her stomach, which caused the rip of her jeans. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. So this would mean that there was no fight as the prosecution claimed. Okay, wow. Okay, let's stop and take a break from our sponsors. We've got a lot to think about. Give your brain the natural nutrients, blood flow, and neurotransmitter support it needs to make the fight with depression an unfair fight. Get stronger daily with Whole Supplement. Build momentum each day with the Whole Depression Relief Stack, the three targeted daily formulas that will help you feel, enjoy, and progress again. So, how do you take the Whole Stack? One, wake up formula. Take wake up in the morning with a glass of water to kick off your day with motivation and energy. Number two is the daytime formula. Take daytime around lunch to ensure you have the focus, mood, and productivity to power through the day. That sounds like something we all need. Number three, 
the Sleep It Off formula. Take Sleep It Off about an hour before you plan to go to sleep for amazing rest and brain support that will consistently set you up for better days. I've experienced depression since I was a teen. I try to do my best to take care of my mental and emotional health and manage my anxiety and depression. But even with medication, I can find myself struggling some days. I started taking whole supplement just a couple weeks ago, and I already feel like I am giving my body the armor it needs to win the fight each and every day. The ingredients in whole supplements have been used for hundreds of years. They just haven't been put together this way to help people struggling with depression. There are no proprietary blends and no hidden ingredients in whole supplement. So here's Adam Steer, founder and CVO of Whole Supplement. I started Whole Supplement with a mission to help others who, like myself, have struggled with finding relief from depression and anxiety. Our number one goal is to empower everyone we can to make meaningful progress every single day. So now is the time to take care of your emotional and mental health. During the pre-launch offer, you can receive the entire Whole Depression Relief Stack at 15% off. Go to wholesupplement.com and use code Rocky Mountain. Again, go to wholesupplement.com and use coupon code Rocky Mountain. Simplify your fight with the Whole Stack from Whole Supplement. Thank you again to our sponsors. So Dr. DeMeo is claiming that all of the evidence is pointing to a contact wound on her front, not an exit wound, right? Yes. Exactly. So four things happen with a contact wound. So first, the compressed air cuts into the skin. It actually, the air cuts into the skin. Second, the bullet enters. And third, multiple liters of hot gas proceed, go into the body after the bullet. Yeah, and all of that hot gas like damages the skin and also enters into the bullet wound which can cause a sudden expansion of the abdomen, snapping off the button and tearing her pants, right? Science. Science. It's amazing. amazing. Interesting, huh? So next up, Judy Bunker. She is a blood spatter expert, and she examined the walls of the room where Ernestine died. The splatter was about 18 inches off of the floor. Uh, Miss Bunker believed that the blood splatter showed Ernestine was sitting on the floor or possibly kneeling with the rifle held at her stomach. There was no proof that Ernestine was shot in the back as the prosecution believed and that she like had magically twisted in the air when she fell. In fact, in the rare cases that someone does spin around due to impact, body fluids usually disperse all over the area. So the blood splatter does not support that the fact that she spun. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. There were no fluids showing any type of twisting motion like the prosecution had said in the first in the first trial. The defense believed that Ernestine held the muzzle of the upside down rifle against her stomach and leaned over. Ernestine would have pushed the trigger, not pulled it, because she was on the muzzle end of the rifle, which makes sense. Now, the prosecution tried to prove this theory false by pointing out that no blood or tissue was found on the muzzle, right? It had full contact with her body. They were trying to say surely there would be like blowback splatter on the gun, yeah. right? Which I would think, again, something that just doesn't quite make sense in this case, I would think that there would be. And of course, just like as in the first trial, the prosecution experts testified there was no GSR on Ernestine's blouse, proving that the gun must have been at least three feet away when fired. Yet the defense came back with this new scanning electron microscope evidence, and this did show GSR on the blouse. So another point to the defense there. Oh, the defense also wanted to bring in evidence that Ernestine did suffer from emotional and mental distress. Sad to say, but she did have multiple slash marks on her wrists due to numerous attempts to end her life. Moxley documented that she attempted to take her life between five and 12 times prior to her death. I mean, that is just a lot of new evidence to come into the second trial. It's it's unrecognizable yeah, from the first. Mm -hmm. The whole trial is just different. Wow, it's crazy. Yeah. I still can't get over the fact that Martin said he didn't wake up with the gun when the gun was fired. Like, the, 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 I don't know if it'll ever make sense to me. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 it doesn't make sense to me either. Yeah, Moxley again brought in an expert on the subject. Dr. Harry Hollian, an acoustic expert, testified for the defense. He used the body of a dead horse and draped the animal with fabric similar to Ernestine's blouse to recreate the shot with a 300 Magnum rifle. 
That'd be crazy to be in that room and gross. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So using a decibel reader, he was able to give evidence of the volume of the shot. So here's a crash course in decibel reading. So you ready, Mel? Here we go. Yeah. Using sound as an example, um, the decibel reading can give you an example of how loud something is on the scale. Like, for example, a lawnmower or a hairdryer is about 85 to 100 decibels. A firecracker or a jet engine is about 125 to 155 decibels. Yeah. So back to the test created by Dr. Holian, he first shot the rifle from three feet away. It was rated on the decibel scale as between 110 and 120. So this is about like as loud as a motorcycle. But when the muzzle of the rifle was placed against the material and the horse's carcass, the shot sounded much different. In fact, it wasn't loud at all. About as loud as if you kicked a piece of furniture. That is just so crazy. It's crazy. Oh my gosh. So with all of that, the jury had to decide what they believed. The defense claimed that Ernestine died by suicide after she sat on the floor, one hand holding the muzzle and the other reached for the trigger with the rifle upside down. Or the prosecution, Ernestine died by murder with her husband, Martin Frias, as the triggerman. As the jury deliberated, they wondered if a woman Ernestine's size could physically do what the defense claimed. So they took the actual gun into the jury room. A juror who was about Ernestine's size sat on the floor and replicated the defense's claim. And she could do it. Yeah. In fact, her fingers rested on the scope right where Ernestine's fingerprints were found. The trial, which began on December 1st, ended on December 12th. The jury, consisting of six men and six women, reached a verdict in about an hour and 45 minutes. At 5 p.m., they entered the courtroom. Not guilty. Martin Frias was acquitted of all charges. So what do you think, Becky? Becky? I'm curious, do you think he did it or do you think he was innocent? I think he was innocent. Yeah? I think he was innocent. I. This is a crazy case. I st I know with the dead horse and everything, the gunshot just still doesn't make sense. But I think, I'm, let's go with the science. Let's go with the science. And it makes sense with her, especially with the jeans ripped, the button popped off, like all of that's lining up, the gas, all of the GSR. It makes, yeah. It's crazy, though. The defense was able to explain everything. So I think regardless of whether he's guilty or not, I think there's enough evidence to make me have reasonable doubt. Yes. Right. Yes. You're you're 100 percent right. Like, I think there's definitely enough for reasonable doubt. Yeah. It's just mm -hmm. it's weird that he would have from the very beginning started lying to the police. Right. His first reaction when the police came, which was to lie to them. Right. Mm -hmm. Which. They have come out for domestic disputes in the past. Maybe he's just already defensive. I don't know. But and you know what? Some people, their first reaction is, I don't want anything to do with this. Right. Like, I want to get myself, I want to place myself as far away as possible. I'm sure that he has had received some, you know, racism in the past as as, as a Mexican-American. Yeah. And there was also that language barrier. So... And a language barrier. That doesn't help either. And they only know him as like this, you know, abusive guy. Yeah. So Martin Frias now lives in Southern California. He is an American citizen and is married with a baby girl and has a good career. He has tried to gain custody of his other children, but they were raised by Ernestine's mother in Wyoming. Martin Frias is quoted saying, American justice, it does work. It's better than I thought. So here's the amazing thing. I love this. All of the experts in the forensic community rallied around Martin Frias during his second trial. They did all of this work pro bono. Um, he, there's no way he could have ever afforded all of these experts and their you know, input and testimonies. Yet these experts were committed to justice instead of just financial gain. That is awesome. Yeah, that's so amazing to hear. Like this is one of those situations where the service is much more than like the financial gain could ever be. They got to be a part of saving a man's life, which is amazing. So yeah. let's gather around the campfire, Mel, for our Rocky Mountain Redemption. Let's do it. <laughs> Courtesy of the Good News Network, we've got you, Wyoming. We've got a heartwarming story that shows the generosity of Wyomingites. And by the way, I looked that up. It's a you and a Wyoming person from Wyoming is called a Wyomingite. I was going to ask him like, that doesn't sound right. I looked it up. There you go. <laughs>
An eight-year-old boy saved up all of his hard-earned cash and bought the skis he always wanted. During a trip down a Targi Resort ski run, he lost one of the skis in the powder and every effort by his family to find it failed. Next, a passionate plea on social media by a family friend in February garnered no luck as the area was still too covered in snow. So they waited a few months and then posted one more time, hoping the snow melt in Alto, Wyoming would bring some good luck and show the ski. Yeah. Local skiers Scott Babbitt and Randy Slate decided to make it their mission. They gathered as much information as they could on the location of the lost ski and they headed up the mountain. And Becky, guess what? They found the ski. This is so cool. The family was over the moon grateful and the young boy will now forever believe in the kindness of strangers. Yeah, what a cool service to be able to go and do that. I mean, they just went around, they trekked in the snow um, to find a ski for a boy that you don't even know, right? It's amazing. It's amazing. So, and that is your Rocky Mountain Redemption. Thank you so much for listening today. We want to remind you to follow us on social medias. I'm just going to refer you to our show notes and you can go to our link tree and find everything there so I don't have to repeat them all for you. There you go. You're so good at it, though. Oh. Yeah. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps us out. We will be back next Wednesday with another story to tell you straight from the Rocky Mountains. So until then, folks, keep your hands clean. 